Okay, we're back, and we're going to try this again. Um, having technical difficulties, and the sound was out, and then I was and I was breaking up, and blah blah blah. So we're going to start the reading over. Uh, I wasn't very far into it anyway. So here we go for chapter two of Atlantis and the Kingdom of the Neanderthals. All right. In November 1998, Joy and I set out on a visit to, to Egypt. We were going to sail down the Nile with a group of writers who were interested in ancient civilizations. Our fellow travelers included John West, Robert Bovel, Robert Temple, Michael Bejant, Ralph Ellis, and Yuri Stoyanov, an expert on the ancient religion of dualism. It was my intention to gather material for the Atlantis blueprint, which I was due to start writing soon after our return. We flew to Cairo and took a taxi to our hotel, the Mena House, located within half a mile of the Sphinx. The following morning, we were up at half past five to go and watch the sun rise behind the pyramids. Looked out at a photograph, the pyramids do not seem at all mysterious. They are basically huge piles of stones. But when you stand directly in front of this great pyramid, you see the problem. It would not be difficult to lay the first, second, even third course of granite blocks, weighing between two and six tons each. This task could be done by sheer manpower. But you still have another 200 courses to go. How do you get the blocks up to, say, tier 150? Building a sloping build a sloping ramp and drag them up but to get them to that height you would need as much material in the ramp as the pyramid itself moreover to avoid collapse it would have to be made of uh, have to be of solid stone could portable lifting gear be used to raise the stones a block at a time as herodotus said the built said the builders did Using this method, it would take a day to raise and position just one block, and even at 25 blocks a day, the pyramid would take 274 years to complete. Remember, it contains 2.3 million blocks. 
Uh, Herodotus said it only took 20 years to build, an obvious impossibility unless the builders had some secret that we have forgotten. Hire a giant crane? We have none in the modern world that could do the job. How about wind power? An American scholar, Dr. Maureen Clemens, has conducted a series of extraordinary Okay, sorry. Um, extraordinary experiments to try to show that wind power could have been utilized in the construction of the pyramids. In 2004, Dr. Clemens demonstrated that stones and obelisks weighing many tons apiece could be raised into the air using giant kites and then guided into position from wooden scaffolding. But she admits that she has no idea of how certain blocks weighing 80 tons were maneuvered into position in the heart of the Great Pyramid. Any tourist who has seen these blocks will agree that the problem of raising them simply defies imagination. In the 1980s, a remarkable scholar named Joseph Yoakums, who wrote under the name Halandris, produced a bold and wide-ranging book about the, about the challenge. In the book, he addressed the impossible engineering feats, stone blocks that were placed into position where no crane, lever, or sheer human strength alone could have put them. In 1978, Yokums wrote, the Nippon Corporation of Japan received permission from the government of Egypt to construct a mini pyramid, which was to be located just to the southeast of the third pyramid at Giza. The aim of the project was not for size but technique. The Japanese endeavored to complete the pyramid building task by utilizing the same methods supposedly employed by the ancient Egyptians, or at least the methods claimed by they employed uh, by modern archaeologists. The Japanese objective was to quarry the stone out of nearby hills, float them by raft across the Nile, drag them to the building site by the heave-ho method of large numbers of men pulling on the stones with ropes, and finally, lifting and placing the stones into the pyramid structure with simple levers. But no sooner had the work on the pyramid had had the, had sorry had work begun on the pyramid when the planners found themselves faced with insurmountable problems. First, the rock for the stones resisted most of the hand tools that tried to cut them, so the workmen had to resort to air jackhammers. Then the quarried blocks could not be safely floated on the Nile River by a wooden raft, so finally they were ferried across by steamboat. Once ashore, the stones were tackled by large teams of Arab workmen hired by the Japanese, but the stones would not budge, sinking instead into the river silt and desert sands. <coughs> Again, modern technology had to be called upon, and heavy trucks were strained to their limits to, in transporting stones to the pyramid site. As the last straw, neither could the great number of workmen lift the large weights using ropes, levers, or pulleys, and large power cranes and helicopters had to come to the rescue. Even then, employing the most powerful lifting equipment known to today's technology, the work of placing the stones into the pyramid was slow and tedious, with the blocks left greatly out of alignment, and many broken and battered by the difficult and clumsy handling. At this point, the Egyptian government intervened, fearing that the unauthorized heavy equipment was destroying the desert environment, ordered what little of the Japanese pyramid had been built to be torn down and removed. The Sphinx is perhaps slightly less problematic, but only slightly. Unlike most visitors, we were allowed inside the Sphinx enclosure. Before the sun rose, it was uncomfortably cold. Then as the light flooded across the desert landscape, intolerably hot. It was particular, I was particularly anxious to get a close look at the Sphinx in, enclosure because although this was my second visit, I had been made to keep my distance with the other tourists on the first. Now I was able to see the weather erosion that had convinced John West that it was thousands of years older than it was supposed to be. West was not the first to say so. Before that, an eccentric French alchemist named René Schwaller de Lubitz had suggested the same idea. Schwaller had spent 
much of his life trying to understand how the red and blue glass of Chartres, uh, Chartres Cathedral had been stained without pigment. He became obsessed by the art of medieval craftsmen and by the question of where those artisans acquired their knowledge. In the mid-1930s, Schwaller went to Egypt with his wife Isha, or Isha. There they saw the tomb of Ramses VI and a wall decoration showing the pharaoh as the hypotenuse of a right-angle triangle whose sides are three, four, and five. This proved that the ancient Egyptians knew the, the Pythagoras theorem nearly a thousand years before Pythagoras. Suddenly, Schwaller was convinced that the knowledge of the medieval craftsmen dated back to ancient Egypt. As soon as Schwaller saw the Sphinx and its enclosure, he recognized that its erosion was due to water, not wind-blown sand. If a rock surface is sandblasted, it will erode in layers with the hard rock projecting and the softer rock worn away. If it is rain blasted, it is again worn into layers, but also into vertical fissures where the water has run down. And the walls of the Sphinx enclosure show both kinds of weathering, vertical as well as horizontal. This was quite clear to us as we stood in front of the wall. The rock was rounded into curves like a baby, baby's bottom, but Egypt has very little rain. Schwaller and West reasoned that the last time significant rain fell in the region was at the end of the last ice age, about 10,000 BC. This factor seemed to support the view that the Sphinx was carved by survivors from Atlantis. The Sphinx, which gazes east, originally had two temples in front of it, one to the right and one to the left. Only the right-hand one, one, the so-called Sphinx Temple, is now complete. In 200 ton, its 200-ton limestone blocks were actually sliced straight out of the ground on either side of the Sphinx, and we still have no idea of how they were raised into position. Geologists speculate that the Sphinx was originally a great lump of hard rock projecting out of the limestone and that at some remote time this rock was carved into the semblance of a head, possibly a lion, which would make sense if it was carved in the age of Leo, 10,000 BC. Then someone decided to add a lion's body to it, so a deep trench was cut into the limestone, creating blocks. This created a wall around two sides of the Sphinx, at some point, a later king decided to put his own face in place of the lion's, but this involved making the head smaller. It still looks absurdly small compared to its vast body. Since we know the Sphinx has, was buried up to its neck in sand when early explorers came to Egypt, we can assume that it has been protected by a shroud of sand for thousands of years. According to a stele found between the Sphinx's paws, the pharaoh Thutmose IV had a dream in about 1425 BC in which he was asked by the sun god to clear away the sand. The Sphinx is 240 feet long and 60 feet high. We walked to its rear end, which has been repaired with great stone blocks. This repair apparently was done by the pharaoh Shephren, son of Cheops, Khufu, who built the Great Pyramid. But since Shephron lived around 2500 BC, it seems a little odd that he was already having to repair a monument that, according to archaeologists, was built by his father about 50 years earlier. Surely from the rate at which it weathered, the Sphinx must have been at least centuries old at the time of Cheops and Shephron. By half past nine in the morning, it was getting atrociously hot, and we were longing for a long time. Cool, cool drink, so we sneaked off back to the hotel along with John West, who was also heading there for breakfast. Over the meal, John reminded us how he had been able to prove that the face of the Sphinx is not that of the Pharaoh Shephron, as Orthodox archaeologists insist. West's discovery arose from a small statue found buried in the Sphinx temple, which, is the, ar which the archaeologists declared to be that of Shephron. 
John thought the Sphinx's face looked nothing like Shefferin, and he asked a police forensic artist named Frank Domingo to come to New York and take a look. After studying the two faces, Domingo declared that he found no resemblance between them. He even did a scale drawing of the head of Shefferin and another of the battered face of the Sphinx, which looks as if it had been used for canon practice at some time in its history. Domingo showed that the chin of the Sphinx is far more prominent than Shefferin's, and that a line drawn from the Sphinx's ear to the corner of its mouth sloped at an angle of 32 degrees, while a line from Shefferin's ear to his mouth only sloped at 14 degrees. Um, that discrepancy was conclusive. After, after breakfast, we all went to the Cairo Museum and looked at the statue of Shefran that had been found in the Sphinx Temple. Joy and I agreed it looked nothing like the Sphinx. In the entrance hall of the museum, we also saw the aerial photograph of the pyramids that had so impressed Robert Bovell and was, has formed the basis of his theory that the Giza pyramids were built on a reflection of Orion's belt. Bovell pointed out that the Nile stands in exactly the same relationship to the pyramids as the broad band of the Milky Way stands to the stars of Orion's belt. The mirroring effect is exact. The following morning, we took a plane to Aswan, 500 miles down the Nile, where the river emerges from Ethiopia. I was anxious to see the ancient town because it had played an important part in the Hapgood theory. It had originally been called the called Sien, Sien, S Y E N E, and was was there a was where a genius named Eratosthenes, sorry, <laughs> Eratosthenes, established the size of the Earth. Eratosthenes happened to know that the sun was reflected in the depths of a deep well in Sien at midday on Midsummer's Day. That fact meant, of course, that the sun was precisely overhead, so that towers did not cast a shadow. But in Alexandria, 500 miles south, the tower did cast sh towers did cast shadows. All Eratosthenes... Tosten, yeah, Eratosthenes had to, uh, to do was measure the length of the shadow at a tower in Alexandria at precisely midday on June 21st. This told him the angle of the sun's rays at Alexandria on the sa at the same moment when they were also falling vertically on Sien. This angle was 7 degrees. If 7 degrees represents 500 miles of the Earth's curved surface, it is easy to see that 360 degrees amounts to 24,000 miles, a rem remarkably accurate assessment for 240 BC. Due to a slight miscalculation of distance, Eratosthenes increased the size of the Earth by 4 degrees. Hapgood discovered that if he allowed for this miscalculation, the Perioris map became even more accurate. Since the Earth is a sphere, but a map is flat, today mapmakers use Mercator's projection based on division into latitude and longitude. The ancient mapmakers used a method that was more complicated but just as effective. They chose a center, drew a circle around it, then subdivided it into 16 slices like a cake. Then they drew a series of squares around the circumference of the cake ex extending outward. The original center of the Perioris map was in Egypt, but was way off the map. Alexandria seems to be the obvious place for the center, but more calculations showed it had to be further south. In fact, it proved to be Sien. This discovery, Hapgood realized, had some interesting implications. When the mapmakers of Alexandria set out to make a new map, it is unlikely that they actually sailed to the various places they were mapping. They probably used older maps, and without the four degree error, these old maps must have been remarkably accurate, which suggests that the pre-Alexandria mapmakers possessed a more accurate and advanced mapmaking science than the Greeks had. In fact, 
interesting evidence exists proving that this was was so. Toward the end of the second century BC, the Greek grammarian Agatharchides of Nidus, I've never seen that word, C-N-I-D-U-S. My guess is Nidus, um, who was a tutor to, so Agatharchides of Nidus, who was a tutor to one of Ptolemy, of the Ptolemy kings of Egypt, was told that, according to ancient tradition, the base of each side of the Great Pyramid was precisely one-eighth of a minute of a degree of the Earth's circumference. A minute is a sixtieth of a degree. The pyramid's base is just over 230 meters. Now, if we test that t statement by multiplying 230 by 8 to get it into minutes, then by 60 to get it into degrees, then by 360 to get the size of the Earth, the result is just under 400,000 kilometers or just under 25,000 miles, an amazingly accurate estimate of the length of the equator. So it seems that the architect of the pyramids already knew the size of the Earth in 2500 BC. Indeed, this is proved by the Great Pyramid itself. Not only is its base in exact proportion to the equator, but also its height is in the same exact proportions to the height of the Earth from its center to the North Pole. The Egyptians would probably have preferred to construct a huge geodesic dome to represent the earth but that kind of construction would have involved losing some of the fascinating geometry of a pyramid so they did the best next best thing when napoleon invaded egypt in 1798 one of the learned men he took along with him uh i'm gonna butcher this edme francois jomard uh, studied the Great Pyramid carefully and made some important discoveries. The four sides of the pyramid point to the four points of the compass, north, south, east, and west, with incredible accuracy. The pyramid is 10 miles from Cairo, which is at the base of the Nile Delta, so-called because it is a triangle of streams running into the sea. And if diagonals are drawn from the pyramid, they neatly enclose the delta. Moreover, a line drawn from exactly halfway along the north face slices the delta into two exact halves. All of these facts indicate that the ancient Egyptians had some extremely precise method of measuring long distances and did not do it by rough guesswork. The French meter is supposed, supposed to be precisely one ten millionth of the distance from equator to pole. Jomard's study of the pyramid convinced him that the Egyptians had also used a measure based on the Earth's size. In this case, 216 thousandths of the equator. 216 thousand is 60 cubed. Uh, this inf information is astonishing. How could a fairly primitive agricultural civilization know the size of the Earth? What is equally hard to understand is why this knowledge had to be rediscovered by Eratosthenes more than 2,000 years later, unless we recall that until Columbus sailed to America, the general belief was that the earth was flat. Knowledge can be lost very easily, as Hapgood emphasized at the end of his book, Maps of the Ancient Sea Kings, which I found out I do have. Where did the Egyptians learn all this knowledge of distances and measurements? We could understand if they were great seafarers like the Vikings, but they weren't. They were inclined to stick to their own land and their own sea, so they can only have learned it from some earlier civilization. Hapgood concluded that their evident knowledge of longitude implies a people unknown to us, a nation of seafarers with inst instruments for finding longitude undreamed of by the Greeks. Joy and I didn't see, didn't get a chance to see the famous well of 
Eratosthenes, for the simple reason that no one knows where it is. It probably vanished centuries ago. Instead, we went on board our boat, the Sun Queen, and had an excellent dinner. As we sailed down the Nile, we were amazed by the richness and greenery of the landscape between the river and the desert. Our destination was the Temple of Edfu, one of the oldest and best preserved in Egypt, and also one of the most impressive, although not on the same scale as Karnak. What makes it so important in a, is a picture narrative of the battle between Horus and Set, which is inscribed on the outer walls, and some texts known as the building texts that are associated with it, which tell us about the building of the temple and offer us a glimpse into a remote period in history. According to the Egyptians, the world was destroyed by a flood at some time in the distant past, which they call Zeptepi, the first time. The date given for this first time seems to be about 10,000 BC, and so could easily be the flood that was caused by the destruction of Atlantis. The original mythical temple, dated from this remote time, and only later was given physical form in stone and brick. Edfu is one of the most sacred sites in Egypt. Um, on the matter of sacred sites, I was in basic disagreement with Flem Ath. That's the person he's co-writing the book with, Flem Ath. Um, he thought they were simply ancient markers laid down to indicate earthquake zones. My own investigation of ancient sites like Stonehenge and Karnak, and this is Karnak with a C, so it's the French one, not Karnak with a K, which is the Egyptian one. Um, Stonehenge and Karnak had instead convinced me that they were chosen as sacred because they were they contain whirlpools of some earth force that can literally produce magical effects. As vice president of the Ghost Club Society, I have noted again and again how often hauntings are associated with whirlpools of earth force. Ooh, excuse me. And, why, and when writing a book on UFOs, I have noted how frequently UFOs were seen in such areas. When approaching the megaliths at Stonehenge with a dousing rod, I have actually felt this force. It is like walking into a powerful magnetic field. In certain places, the force can produce an unpleasant effect, making one feel disoriented, as if suffering from a slight fever. I once felt this at Karnak in Brittany, and noticed that it became almost tangible in a small field with many standing stones, where my dousing rod twisted in my hand as if it were alive. Our guide at Edfu was... Emil Shaker, Shakar, Shaker, Sh whatever, an authority on ancient Egypt. He was convinced that sound played an important part in the mystery of the temples. In 1998, scientists at Southampton University discovered that the megaliths like at Stonehenge uh, have acoustic properties and could have acted as gigantic amplifiers for drums during festivals. Their flat surfaces accumulating and reflecting sound over a wide area, and we discovered that temples had the same effect, functioning almost like an echo chamber. We stood in a doorway in a temple courtyard and made a deep humming sound, and it was amplified by the stone. Emil pointed out hieroglyphics on the wall close to the sanctuary. Those, he said, specified the number of times the temple ritual had to be performed. In this case, it was three. Quote, the ritual must be enchanted three times or it will not work. He said, the ritual involved chanting a hymn to the sun and presenting the god with offerings. I asked, but what does the ritual actually do? It activates the temple, Emil said. You mean like switching on a light, I said, giving voice to the first image that came into my head. Emil nodded, exactly like switching on a light. So a ritual that involved chanting could somehow switch on the temple. It seemed almost like the sequence of actions we have to perform to send an email.
the sanctuary, which occupied the place where a visitor would expect an altar, was a kind of enormous box of gray granite turned on its side. I started to walk toward the back, facing the temple wall, but found this narrow passage blocked by someone who was obviously meditating with his forehead against the stone of the sanctuary. I recognized our fellow traveler, Michael Bajant, who is, has collaborated on a number of books on the Templars and René Le Chateau, uh, uh, which is uh, one of the sites where uh, they claim Mary Magdalene is buried, if I remember right. Uh, in France, of course. Um, I backed away quietly and joined John West, who took us to look at the building texts, which refer back to the first time, when the seven sages are believed to have designed the temple and the pyramids. Then we strolled out to the courtyard at the back, actually the front, and enjoyed the sunshine. A brisk wind was blowing up the river. Summoned to the bus, we were taken back to the Sun Queen for lunch. An hour later, Robert Bovel came to tell me that Michael had not returned with the rest of us. Since Michael was due to lecture at 3.30, Robert wondered if I would step in and give Michael's lecture instead, which I did. We were all worried when Michael about Michael, for we were in bandit country, and since visiting Aswan, we had been escorted by the military in case of terrorist attack. Only a short time ago, German tourists had been machine gunned at a temple, at the temple of, of Hatshepsut in the Valley of the Queens. About two hours later, Michael turned up in a taxi. I asked him what had happened. I don't know. I was meditating for a few minutes, then I found you'd all gone. But I knew that it wasn't just a few minutes since I had seen him meditating for at least 20. When I told him so, he was surprised. It only seemed a few minutes. What happened to Michael puzzled me for a long time. Obviously, he had tuned in to vibrations of Edfu, and time had stood still. But was that the whole truth? A purely mechanical process like switching on a light? I had a strong feeling that there was more to it than that. But it was not until six years later when I was writing this book that I stumbled on what must surely be the true solution. My suspicion that the secret of the temples lay in sound vibration was supported by an American engineer named Chris Dunn, who was convinced that the Great Pyramid was a kind of gigantic sound box. Dunn had bribed the guard to allow him to remain in the king's chamber when everyone else had left and had struck the sarcophagus with his fist and recorded its frequency, then hummed the note. When he played back the tape later, he found that his hum had caused sympathetic vibrations in the chamber. When he went outside, leaving the tape recorder running and called for the guard to turn off the lights, his shout was recorded just as loudly as if he were still in the chamber proof that the chamber had unusual acoustic properties. Another friend, David Elkington, stumbled on something equally fascinating. In his book, In the Name of the Gods, he describes how in Giza he met a sound engineer named John Reed, to whom he explained his theory that the pyramid was somehow alive and responded to sound. Reed verified this observation with a curious experiment. He made a temporary repair of the broken corner of the sarcophagus with an aluminum corner, then stretched a plastic membrane over the top of the sarcophagus and sprinkled sand on it. A small loudspeaker was connected to a sine wave oscillator, which was then switched on. The sand quickly began to arrange itself into patterns, like sand on a drum. To Reed's amazement, the sand began to form a whole series of Egyptian religious symbols, the pharaoh's ritual headdress, the Ankh, and the sacred eye of Horus, bringing an entirely new meaning to the Masonic phrase, the eye in the pyramid. Photographs of these patterns are printed in Elkington's book, and they leave no doubt that our guide, Emil Shaker, 
was right. The secret of ancient Egypt is connected with sound patterns. Elkington describes the sound rituals of the temples and pyramids as an acoustic Eucharist. How much more is there in this chapter? I can feel my voice. Oof, we have a ways to go. Almost 10 pages to go. Okay, hydrate. In the Valley of the Kings, the following day, we went into the splendid tomb of Ramses VI. I was fascinated when Emil pointed out a design that was unmistakably that of a sperm cell on the wall of the long descending corridor. But how could the ancient Egyptians have known about sperm? Had they invented the microscope? It was not until the following year when I was reading Jeremy Narby's book, The Serpent Power, that I came upon a plausible solution, which I shall describe later. My pleasure in the temples was undermined by the first rumbles of a stomach bug that caused vomiting and diarrhea. If I had been superstitiously inclined, I might have blamed it on the visit to the tomb of Tutankhamun. It also removed most of the pleasure from the Valley of the Queens, although nothing could diminish the splendor of the temple at Hatshepsut, even the guards with machine guns. The bug was still around the following morning, and a pre-breakfast visit to the Karnak Temple, although, as usual, I was overawed by those vast, elaborate columns, proved to be a little too early even for me, who normally rise at 5.30. It certainly spoiled the visit in the to the temple of Dendera, which was a, a pity since I had wanted to see this for many years, ever since I had written about it in a book called Star Seekers. The ceiling contains a famous zodiac, which, as Sch Schwaller de Lubitz pointed out, proves that the Egyptians knew all about the procession of the equinoxes. Procession is due to a slight wobble on the Earth's axis, reminiscent of a spinning top. Imagine the axis as a giant pencil that sticks through the Earth from pole to pole, and then imagine that the ends of the pencil are searchlights that penetrate into space. If you think of the heavens as a flat ceiling, the searchlight would describe a circle on it. It takes... Ugh. I need to breathe more. It takes 25,776 years to complete this circle, so it is hard to imagine how the ancients knew about the snail paste phenomena, let alone became so obsessed by it. Procession's practical effect is to make the constellations appear to move backwards. We all know how the year progresses from Aries through Taurus, Gemini, and Cancer until it reaches Capricorn, Aquarius, and Pisces. But in the stars, every spring starts a little earlier. If procession was thousands of times faster, the spring would rise in Pisces one year, Aquarius the next, Capricorn the next, and so on, moving backwards west instead of east. The ancients noted this odd backward movement of the heavenly clock and attributed tremendous importance to it. It seemed to them a glimpse into the mind of the gods, and they pondered what it meant. Every civilization knew about it. Eskimos, Icelanders, Norsemen, Finns, Hawaiians, Japanese, Persians, Romans, Greeks, Hindus. It almost seems as if it were as if our ancestors did nothing but gaze at the night sky. At Dendera, there are in essence two zodiacs carved one on top of the other. One has its east-west axis passing through Pisces, showing it was constructed at the beginning of the age of Pisces, about 2100 years ago. But two hieroglyphs on the edge of the zodiac suggest a second axis that passes through the beginning of the age of Taurus more than 4,000 years earlier. So the builders of the Dendera knew Taurus would give way to Aries and then Pisces. In other words, they knew about procession. So it looks as if the Egyptians not only knew the precise size of the earth 
down to the meter, but also knew about the past 26,000 years. It, uh, I'm going to hydrate again. We made our we made one more major stop before we flew back to Cairo, and it was the one I looked forward to most of all. A visit to the mysterious Osirian, the tomb of Osiris, or Osiris, if you prefer, which was built behind the temple of Osiris at Abydos. The temple was built by the pharaoh Seti I, father of Ramses II, who figures as the oppressor of the Israelites in the Bible. The, the Osirian is a small temple built of megalithic blocks, like the Sphinx Temple of Giza, and the bareness and bleakness of the architecture makes it look completely unlike the temples of Karnak or Luxor with their elaborate wall de decorations. The reason I was so eager to see it was that I suspected that it had been built by Atlanteans, the same people who had carved the Sphinx and built the Sphinx Temple. It was found early in the 20th century as Flinders Petrie and his assistant Margaret Murray were clearing away deep sand behind the temple of Seti I. With thousands of tons of sand to remove, they finally left the job to Professor E. Neville, who in 1912 realized that this was quite unlike the architecture of the Temple of Seti I. The megalithic style gave, gave it a resemblance to a miniature Stonehenge with trilithons. Neville's work was interrupted by the First World War. Then a young archaeologist named Henry Frankfurt took over and completed the operation. He found the name of Seti I written on the stone, not carved, and a broken potsherd inscribed Seti I is of service to Osiris. The potsherd seemed to com confirm Frankfurt's research. He decided that the Osirian was built by Seti I as a temple to Osiris. Osiris. Margaret Burry pointing out that the pharaohs were fond of adding their names to monuments of the past, so the inscription by Seti proved nothing, any more than the statue of Shephron proved he had built the Sphinx Temple. And this temple, with its vast blocks, one of them 25 feet long, was certainly quite unlike the temple of Seti I above it. But by then, Margaret Murray had begun to get herself a bad name in the academic establishment with her eccentric views. For example, that the medieval witches were really priestesses of a cult dedicated to the horned god Pan, and so no one paid much attention. A far more straightforward scenario was possible that the Assyrian was built long before the temple of Seti I and that Seti had chosen that same spot to build his temple, hoping to curry favor with Osiris. I don't know why I keep switching back and forth between pronunciations. <laughs> um, whose servant he declared himself. At all events, Neville had a real flash of intuition when he announced that the Osirian could well be the most ancient building in Egypt. It could indeed. There is something very mysterious about this building, which, when we, want, when we went to see it, looked more like a swimming pool due to rising waters. Neville even speculated that it might be some primitive waterworks, but although that water was due to the rising water table, the deep trench around Osirian's central platform was undoubtedly intended as a kind of moat. Behind the moat were 17 man-sized cells hinting at a monastery. Now, seven years later, both moat and platform are flooded. The, the Osirian was built on a man-made mound reminding us of the Giza pyramids, and the presence of water seemed to hint at the primeval creation myth. Did priests sit in those cells, gazing on the still water and meditating on the first times? 
I walked down the slope to get as close to the water as I could and was fascinated by its green depths. I stood there so long that Joy had to shout to say that the others had left and the gatekeeper was about to lock the door to the temple. And as I hurried back into the temple with its 13 century carvings and inscriptions, I felt as though I was entering the modern world again. The Osirian is undoubtedly one of the most powerful places in the world. It is as, as well it is as well it is so inaccessible for a stream of visitors would suck away its power as tourists have sucked away the power of the great menshires of Karnak. Again, the Karnak with a C in... Oh, I said menshires, menhirs. I added an S in there. The Karnak, the one in France. Uh, so that only the smaller and more remote stones preserve their primitive force. By evening, we were back in Cairo and 24 hours later, back at home in Cornwall. But I have almost forgotten to mention one of the most important discoveries I made on that trip down the Nile, a staggering piece of evidence that appears to show that our ancestors knew about procession more than 60,000 years ago. In the cabin next to ours was a charming South African couple named Gurth and Marie Walton. After my lecture, they asked me if I knew of a book called Our Cosmic Ancestors by French space scientist Maurice Chatelain. When I said I didn't, they lent me their copy. Within a few hours, I knew I had come upon a discovery that seemed to support Hapgood's assertion that a sophisticated science existed 100,000 years ago. In 1843, a Frenchman named Paul-Emile Botta, who was consul at Mosul in Iraq, then Mesopotamia, began digging at a mound called Koyunjik near the upper Tigris and came upon the library of the Assyrian king Assurbanipal, 669 to 626 BC. Among the clay tablets, he discovered one containing a vast number, 195955200000000. The name of the ruined city in the mound was Nineveh. At that time, even the concept of a million was rarely used in the West, so Boda was perplexed. What on earth could the ancient Assyrians want with a number so vast? Using a computer, Chatelaine discovered that this figure is not as arbitrary as it looks. It is 60 multiplied by 70 to the power of 7. In his book, Chatelaine uh, recalled an obscure piece of information. The Sumerians, who invented writing, did their calculations in 60s rather than 10s. They invented 60 seconds to the minute and 60 minutes to the hour. Suddenly, in a flash of inspiration, Chatelaine wondered if this huge figure could be in seconds. He worked it out to, the, to be 2,268 million days, or some, somewhat over 6 million years. The Sumerians had also been great astronomers who had compiled tables of the no motions of all the planets, including Uranus and Neptune. Did they, Chatelaine wondered, know about the procession of the equinoxes? The, the time it takes for the Earth to complete its processional cycle is just under 26,000 years. He tried dividing this into the Nineveh number and was delighted to find that it was exactly 240 processional cycles, or big years. Now he found himself wondering if this giant number might be what astrologers and occultists used to refer to as the great constant of the solar system, a highest common factor, into which all other numbers, planetary orbits, and so on will divide. He proceeded to calculate the cycles of the planets and their satellites in seconds and found that each could, would divide exactly into the Nineveh number.
This was staggering. Oh, jeez. <sighs> wow. Oh, about five pages to go. This was staggering. Modern science assumes that these ancient astronomers were interested in the heavens for purely superstitious reasons. But if the Nineveh number was what Chatelaine suspected, it proved that the Chaldean astronomers understood our solar system as well as Isaac Newton did. To test this still further, Chatelaine compared the period period of the Earth's rotation with the figure obtained from the Nineveh number. He was slightly puzzled to find a slight discrepancy in the sixth, sixth decimal place. Admittedly, this was inconsistency. This inconsistency was only a 12 millionth of a day per year, but the Nineveh number had proved itself so accurate that he could not understand even such a tiny difference. Then the answer dawned on Chatelaine. We now know that the Earth is slowing down very slowly. In 12 million years, a year will be shorter by a day. For the Nineveh number to fit our Earth's rotation the total accurate, with total accuracy, it is necessary to assume that it was calculated 64,800 years ago, but surely no intelligent being ex existed that long ago. Yet, according to the Nineveh number, Human beings were not only here, but were as scientifically sophisticated as any that followed many millennia later. If so, then who were they? We may take our pick. They may have been Neanderthals, who were still around then, or they may have been our own kind, Cro-Magnons. Manions. Um, or perhaps they were Denikin space visitors, which was Chatelaine's view. It was why he titled his book Our Cosmic Ancestors and why he begins, quote, Most American space flights from Mercury and Gemini to Apollo were followed by unknown spacecraft that could have come from another civilization in outer space. Every time the incident occurred, the astronauts informed Mission Control, who then ordered absolute silence. Chatelaine mentions a cro manian skull found near San Diego that dated from between 50,000 50, and 65,000 years ago, and he cites two scientists who agreed that, that its brain size indicates the highest intelligence and that the man could have been capable of observing and registering astronomical cycles. The long chapter. Chatelaine has forgotten, or perhaps did not know, that the Neanderthal's brain size was far greater than ours. But another possibility must be taken into account, that ordinary human beings like you and me possess quite extraordinary brain powers. One of my favorite examples concerns a six-year-old child named Benjamin Blythe, who in 1826 was out for a walk with his father when the child asked, What time is it? 7.50 a.m., said the father. They walked on for five minutes. Then Benjamin said, In that case, I must have been alive. And he gave the number in seconds, about 190 million. His father wrote it on his cuff, and when they got home, worked it out on paper. He said that he was 172,800 seconds off. No, said Benjamin, you forgot the two leap years. How can such things be possible? Mathematical agility is something that human beings have only developed after thousands of years of civilization. Yet apparently complex math can be done by people without any kind of intellectual sophistication. In fact, they often do it far better than the rest of us, since even people who are mentally defective or unsophisticated can do these things, people known as idiot savants. It would seem to follow logically that humans must be possessed of two sorts of brain skills, the, the kind needed by a great philosopher and the kind utilized by mathematical prodigies such as Benjamin Blythe, who might be regarded as a kind of supercomputer.
But that explanation doesn't work either. Numbers known as primes, numbers like 5, 7, 11, cannot be divided by any other number without leaving a remainder. No mathematical shortcut exists to discover whether some huge number is a prime or not. One simply has to keep on dividing every other number into it to find out. Even a computer has to do it the long way. Yet mathematical prodigies are often able to see at a glance whether a huge number is a prime or not. The psychiatrist Oliver, Oliver Sachs described a pair of subnormal twins in a New York mental hospital who amused themselves by swapping 24-figure primes. It is as if the mind of the twins could hover in the air like a hawk over the whole number field and pounce on prime numbers as if they were rabbits. According to the architect Keith Critchlow, in his book Time Stands Still, whose title makes me think of Michael Bejant's experience at Edfu, this method is the is the one of the ba the this method is the one the Babylon ba try it again this method is the one the Babylonians used to work out a right angle triangle whose size ran to thousands of feet. It probably also explains the Nineveh number studied by Maurice Chatelain. Critchlow is also deeply interested in ancient megaliths and stone circles and in the work of Professor Alexander Tom. In 1933, Tom had moored his sailing yacht near the island of Lewis in the Hebrides when he went ashore at dusk to look at the megalithic stone circle of Kalanish, he noticed that the circle's main north-south axis pointed directly to the pole star, but he knew that the pole star was not in the same position when the circle was built about 5,000 years ago. <coughs> Sorry. As Tom studied Kalanish, and other stone circles, he came to recognize that some of these circles were not circles, but were shaped like eggs or like a letter D. Tom eventually recognized that the builders had created these irregular shapes with the use of Pyth Pythagorean triangles, or Pythagorean. Uh, that's how one teacher pronounced it. I don't know if it's right. Which when we recall the Great Pyramid, sounds like more than coincidence. He concluded that the men who had built them were highly intelligent, or, as he called them, prehistoric Einsteins. Tom also noted that the same basic measure was used in all these circles. He called it the megalithic yard. It was 2.7272 English feet. The basic measure was, in fact, half that, but Tom doubled it to make closer to the yard. A megalithic foot proved to be equal to the Egyptian measure used in the Great Pyramid, known as the Ptolemaic foot. One commentator in the Tom tradition, B. L. van de Werden, uh, said that there must be a pre-Babylonian source of geometry and algebra from which Greece, India, and China all drew their knowledge. Critchlow explained that a culture does not need to be highly complex and technological to be sophisticated. It does not need skyscrapers and great metal bridges. Highly civilized people can live very simply, yet their knowledge can be as profound as that which created the Nineveh number. Once more we face the question, how could our remote ancestors have been capable of working out a number that is 15 digits long, and that, if Chatelaine is correct, amounts to 2,268 million days expressed in seconds? Our observations on calculating prodigies at least offer us a, a glimpse of an answer. Perhaps our ancestors could calculate such numbers as easily as five-year-old Benjamin Blythe or Oliver Sacks's two subnormal, subnormal twins. By suggestion, my suggestion about two types of hair, uh, brain power might also be relevant here. 
The kind of brain power needed by a lightning calculator is mechanical, but the kind required by a great philosopher depends upon something else, the power that was once called inspiration. This power is similar to what Mozart utilized when he composed the Jupiter Symphony. When I was in Majorca in in 1969, I asked the poet Robert Graves his own experience of inspiration, and he advised me to read his short story, The Abominable Mr. Gunn. In this story, Graves describes the odd ability of a schoolfellow named F. F. Smiley, who was a calculating prodigy. The master, Doc, uh, Mr. Gunn, had set the class with a complicated mathematical problem. Smiley simply wrote down the solution and then sat gazing out of the window. Asked how he did it without writing calculations, Smiley replied, replied, it just came to me. Mr. Gunn said, you mean you looked up the answer in the back of the book? Smiley replied, this was not so, and said that anyway, the back of the book got two figures wrong. Mr. Gunn then sent him to the headmaster with a note saying Smiley was to be caned for cheating and gross impertinence. This reminds Graves of his own experience when sitting on a roller behind the cricket pavilion. He received a sudden celestial illumination. Quote, it occur occurred to me that I knew everything. I remembered letting my mind range rapidly over all its familiar subjects of knowledge, only to find that this was no foolish fancy. I did know everything. To be plain, though con conscious of having come less than a third of the way along the path of formal education, and being weak in mathematics, shaky in Greek grammar, and hazy about English history, I nevertheless held the key of truth in my hand and could use it to open the lock of any door. Mine was no religious or philosophical theory, but a simple method of looking sideways at disorderly facts so as to make perfect sense of them. Graves explained that he tried out his insight on various obstinate locks. They all clicked and opened smoothly. The insight was still intact when he woke up next day, but after morning lessons... When he tried to record the insight in the back of an exercise book, quote, my mind went too fast for my pen and I began to cross out a fatal mistake and presently crumpled up the page, end quote. Later, when he tried to write it down under the, the bedclothes, quote, the magic had evaporated and the insight vanished, end quote. Writing about his experience, he said that what struck him at the time was a sudden infantile awareness of the power of intuition, the supra logic that cuts out all routine processes of thought and leaps straight from problem to answer. Before the end of this book, I shall make an attempt to reconstruct what Graves meant. Whew, we made it. That was a long chapter. I can feel my voices about done for the night so it's a good thing it wasn't any longer than it was um, the next one looks to be equally as long yeah it is 38 to 61 so it's only like 23 pages but my comfort zone seems to be in about the 15 page mark so anyway um that is all um kind of interesting i hope he gets more into the the theory uh, um soon um i'm finding that uh, this this kind of stuff so far a little on the the tedious side um but there's a lot of book left to go um a couple hundred pages so it should come along, um, but that is all for this session. I'm going to go ahead and end it and take a short break before I go into playing my first session of We Happy Few. So I will be back in a few minutes in another session. See you there.
Oh, my God.